Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for session six of the IATL conference. We have three wonderful prep papers prepared for presentation at this session, and each of our presenters will be making a 15-minute presentation. Uh, we ask that you hold your questions for the presenters. You can either type them when you have them in the Q&A, but we are going to use the last 15 minutes of this uh, hour for answering questions. Uh, so. Um, uh, that we can make efficient use and make sure that every uh, presenter has an opportunity to make their full presentation. So I will begin with starting with the first. Uh, oh, and I should mention that my name is Chuck Ekman from the University of Miami, and I'm delighted to be your moderator for today's session. Um, uh, the first presenter today will be Dr. Tatiana Sanchez. Uh, she'll be presenting on her topic, Open Science Building Capacity in a Higher Education Institution. Dr. Sanchez is currently head of documentation division at the Faculty of Psychology and at the Education Institute of the University of Lisbon. She is also an invited assistant professor at the University of Alberta, where she serves as a librarian and researcher. She gradu graduated in literature, post-graduated in documentary sciences, a master's in education and reading, as well as a doctor in education and a postdoctorate in information science. She is dedicated to training and research and is the author of several publications at the national and international levels. She is also a member of the Higher Education Libraries Working Group and training member in the National Association of Librarians and Archivists in Portugal. Please welcome Dr. Sanchez. Hello, thank you, Charles. Um, I will now share my screen. Please let me know if you are seeing and if you are hearing me, if you hear me well. Um, are you? It's, Perfect. Everything it's okay? Everything is good. Okay, thank you. So, um, me, I'm uh, in representation of me and my co-authors, Carlos Lopes and Maria de Luz Antunes. Uh, we are a team of researchers and we also three really have librarians and in different institutions that uh, have been doing research together since, I don't know, five or six years from now. So um, in this study, I have to do a disclaimer because this study will explain. I will explain it, but it's a um, proposed. It's an experimental study, um, so I explain it and relate it with open science and the needs for the stakeholders, and do this proposal for a possible answer. So. What is the context? We are all um, addressing this uh, context of overload of information and new learning devices. And we know that libraries are in a path that um, can and, well, they will do something about it because uh, it's, it's more than evident that is a, there is an urgency of reflection and access to the production and dissemination of scientific production by all the stakeholders. But how can we help? In fact, to, to address these issues, academic institutions and their libraries can devise and develop strategies that enable all the actors to make few, fewer use of these resources, assisting them to interact with the open science movement with greater autonomy and effectiveness. So, why we uh, designed this study? Uh, mainly to build capacity. So, we design a curricular propose. It's an experimental uh, a way to try to target researchers 
science managers and information professionals, given the gap of the offer in this area in Portugal. We also know that open access includes all these concepts, uh, research data, data curation, <coughs> open sources, peer review, and citizen science. And we believe that information literacy intervenes in a solid way for uh, the adequacy of these open science principles as an empowerment promoter. So if we can enable all the participants in this movement with the help of information literacy, maybe the movement can grow. Um, in fact, open science uh, brings us a lot of challenges. This requires that management, creation skills arising from global changes to the type and variety of data used in research. And so is, this is a, a little bit scary for uh, mainly for the researchers, but also for users and the supporting staff that are all around this movement. So what can we do? We think and we believe that we can help to build capacity around these uh, issues. So, we know that there are several examples, uh, namely the Open Science Training Handbook that offer, gu offers guidance and resources for trainers and trainees, uh, suggests methods, contents and exercise, and we really in our uh, libraries and in our daily work, we know that it's necessary to promote professional skills and support practice in this ecosystem so that uh, research can fulfill this, all this, the fair um, um, highlights. And so inspired by these initiatives, and being aware that structured training uh, is something that remains scarce, um, we present this study for, well, a, a bigger reflection about training strategies in an academic institution. So we uh, start for with uh, uh, several training initiatives that were autonomous and free attendance that we were developing in the last year and uh, supporting also to, uh, researchers in the tutorial way. And we see here several webinars and workshops on several uh, diverse uh, teams that were um, solicited by these researchers and we were doing this and answering his questions but then we thought maybe what if we create a postgraduate training for information professionals researchers science managers in these principles and best practice of open science to this uh, mobility in this open science ecosystem. So we try to answer these questions. How can researchers be empowered for open science? How can we articulate information literacy with open science for um, fostering them, this? And what are the roles and relations between stakeholders and for, for them to have capacity for the best practices. And well, let's go and be and, and do think and do something about it. So we first did a literature review about these two great areas of open science and information literacy 
and how we can articulate the fair principles and research innovation, and how we, can we also uh, embed civic engagement and education and professional development in an uh, interesting and flexible way. Um, and in fact, this, in this conception, we thought to identify similar training offers, um, their relevance, feasibility, and adequacy to the market, and determine objectives, competencies, etc., programmatic contents. So, the proposal consists in, in its design to information professionals, researchers, and science managers. And it's nothing from the stratosphere or something like that. It's just a practical way to answer these needs. So, basic on this holistic vision of learning information and production and knowledge um, in different media, this is a plan that we can uh, imbib interdisciplinary contact but, um, and use another uh, examples and models and techniques for uh, in a way that complements and in parallel uh, promotes experiential, active and open learning in the collaborative way. So, what are we thinking about? We are thinking about a curricular structure organized in two semesters with a workload of 108 hours and 30 SCTSs with several units where we can um, address open data, open science, a citizen science, uh, digital competences, academic and scientific writing, and, well, whatever we think that is um, appropriate to give uh, context in a practical way. So, the skills to be achieved will be um, about theory and practice of open science, when you were where we include open science, open sources, open research data, etc. Diversifying resources, also um, talking about critical use of scientific scholarly information in several sports, incorporating information literacy practices and understanding its relevance to the achievement of open science, and we also think that it's important to achieve uh, some critical thinking around this um, mainly towards ethical and legal issues surrounding use and sharing of scientific uh, content and integrate scientific environment and several sources and methods. So, in conclusion, we know this is a risked uh, way to build capacity, but someone's got to take the initiative. So align it with this understanding of the diversity of the existing solutions for open science development. And we really believe that the articulation with information literacy it's a must-have in this uh, type of courses. We think that with a set of skills, knowledge, instruments, and theoretical, practical tools for application and ad adaptation, we can do something really interesting for professionals and other stakeholders. So, I really thank you for your attention. And, uh, well, here I am, are my co-authors. We are also um, thinking on this and how to apply. So thank you very much for your attention and 
of course, I will be glad to answer your questions. Thank you very, very much, Tatiana. And I'm hoping that people will use the Q&A tab to, uh, as they have questions, to insert them. We will hold the questions for the end of the session. So, okay. um, so now we will uh, move to the second presenter. Uh, the topic of the presentation is evaluation and analysis of open access electronic resources of the higher education libraries in Portugal. The presenter will be Dr. Jose Carlos Bento de Carvalho. Uh, Dr. Carvalho has a degree in sociology from the Autonomous University of Lisbon, uh, a Master of Science in Documentation, and a PhD, both from the University of Alcala in Spain. He has postgraduate degrees in libraries and archives from the Lusofana University in Portugal and information studies in digital libraries from ISCTE-IUL in Portugal, as well as information studies. That's, 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 the, uh, that's actually the degree. During his professional career, he has been working in the library archives and sociology areas, but since 2016 has been serving as director of the library of the Lusofana University, a higher education in Portugal where he has been working since 2007. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carvalho. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, I'm beginning to share my PowerPoint uh, that have uh, two co-authors. That is um, Maria João Amante and Maria Angeles Zulueta. Uh, this presentation is based on the PhD thesis with the same title, defended in the University of Alcalá in Spain. Uh, this work uh, gives public knowledge of a model built to evaluate two open access platforms, um, uh, online public access catalog and institutional repository uh, on a comparative study at the level of higher education libraries in Portugal. Uh, here we suggest a model that includes a set of features that can provide the content retrieval and presentation model that is reliable, friendly, simple, intuitive, and above all, effective, bene benefiting uh, users and the institution. Uh, there are two research uh, questions. Uh, the first one, uh, do the open access search platforms provided by higher education libraries in Portugal meet the aims that led to their implementation? And the second one, which features and uh, functionalities should be implemented or should be developed in all uh, open access search platforms in use in higher education libraries uh, in Portugal? Uh, the research uh, method was based on literature review, um, OPEC and IR platforms navigation, verifying its structure and operations, resources, uh, tools for searching, retrieving, and presenting inform information. Uh, also constructing an evaluation table with the dimensions of analysis, quantitative and qualitative evaluation, um, writing a model based on the ideal characteristics uh, for these platforms and uh, reviewing it. For the evaluation, we adapted criteria of several authors, not only concerning OPEC and uh, repositories, but also web pages. This um, evaluation um, differs by being, uh, not being exhaustive, using uh, direct uh, observation uh, and analysis that can provide a fast and easy to use mechanism that can be handled by researchers or by the library staff uh, without technical or complex instruments. So uh, here we have the experience given by several authors and the practical use of these two platforms, resulting in three dimensions with nine indicators each in a total of 27 indicators. The first dimension of analysis, analysis A, uh, that is called consistency and uh, clarity in content availability, and I am going to point uh, only some of the indicators. We have, for instance, is visual communication simple and effective? Uh, is there an effective control of authorship? Is there an effective control of uh, subjects? Um, are engines, uh, such engines uh, complete? 
uh, is there a clear identification of the available document typologies and their contents? Uh, and uh, concerning the second dimension of analysis, named value added features, uh, this consists of indicators like uh, is it possible to refine the results retrieved after, after the search? Is there a logical intersection of information adapted for good navigation linking uh, records? Or is, it, is there any system uh, for subscribing alerts uh, for uh, new uh, records? Uh, the third uh, and final dimension of analysis is uh, accessibility and help systems with such indicators like does the system effectively help the user to recognize, diagnose and recover from error situations? Is it possible to recover a history of research conducted during the session? Are the navigation uh, map shortcuts and other options um, uh, giving you Im immediate access to the various uh, sections visible throughout, throughout the navigation? Or is it the platform adapted for use on mobile devices? In this evaluation, the indicators were constructed in the form of questions consisting of the yes answer on adding one point and the no corresponding to zero points concerning the indicators so as the dimensions of analysis. The positive and the negative elements are compared and analyzed to suggest characteristics that can provide good information retrieval and its presentation, offer a good uh, uh, quality service easy to use with effective results, uh, reverse the trend of arbitrary use of resources on the internet and to protect institutions image and credibility. There are 48 higher education libraries here analyzed according to different uh, typologies, uh, uh, 16 from public uh, universities, uh, f uh, 11 from private universities, 16 from public polytechnic institutes, and 5 uh, from private polytechnic uh, institutes. Um, there are differences between them. For instance, uh, 42 have OPEC and only 37 have IR. Concerning the OPEC results, uh, we may see that indicator 7 uh, is uh, the one that gets the best results for the first dimension of analysis. Such engines are complete. The indicator um, 5 um, is uh, where the, the lowest score uh, it is, fo followed by the indicator 3 and the indicator 4 that concerns if uh, the, um, the control of authorship and the control of the subjects. Uh, in the dimension of our analysis B of the OPEC analysis, indicator 2, is there a logical intersection of information adapted for good navigation, is the one that obtains the highest score. And the indicator 9, does it allow connection with other programs for measurement of bibliographic references as the lowest score with the only a positive OPEC. Concerning the dimension of analysis uh, C, uh, the highest score of the, uh, the whole evaluation is indicator uh, 3. Uh, does the search uh, not require the use of accents? And the most negative result is uh, the, uh, the nine in indicator. Does the platform adapt to its use on mobile devices? Uh, here we can see the total values uh, found at the level of dimensions of analysis for the 42 OPECs um, and uh, also the uh, dimension with highest score, that is dimension uh, C, with all 42 OPECs to be fulfilled, accessibility and help systems. Here it is demonstrated uh, the different results according each one of the libraries typology with the public uh, universities with the highest uh, uh, score. Uh, in the results concerning the repositories, 
we can see that the highest values in dimension of analysis A are indicators uh, 2, uh, 6, 8 and 9, all with the same score, 37 in the maximum, related to the preview of the summaries, terminology, ordering of the search results with unequivocal identification of the document uh, typologies, and it is observed that def the uh, deficient control of both authorship and subjects, and it is uh, very evident here. Uh, concerning uh, the analysis, uh, the, the dimension of analysis B, uh, we can see that the highest values are in, in, in the indicator uh, 7. Uh, is there a subscription to system alerts for new records with all 37 repositories evaluated, as well as indicator 4? Uh, is it possible to download uh, documents in open access? It is observed that not, none of the repositories makes it possible to search in external en engines for a greater collection of elements. Uh, concerning uh, dimension of analysis for the repositories, we can see that uh, the indicator with more positive value is an indicator one. Uh, is there no errors in accessing content or, uh, or sections of the platform? And it is observed that no, none of the repositories allow to consult the search history. Here we can see um, the, the total uh, uh, values found for the dimensions of analysis of the 37 repositories. The dimension uh, with the highest score, uh, as also in the OPEC, is the accessibility and health systems. Here we demonstrate also the differences between each type of uh, library typology. Uh, here are the results of comparison uh, between uh, OPEC and the uh, repository indicators according to the different types of higher education uh, libraries, so as in the dimension of the analysis in the totals. Regarding the first question, um, the conclusions are the following. Among uh, positive points, it was verified that in both platforms, OPAC and IR, uh, search engines are largely complete. There is a logical intersection of information adapted for good navigation and linking records. The terminology used is proper for the users. The visual communication is simple and effective. Search does not require the use of word accents. Navigation maps and shortcuts and other options are visible for navigation. It is possible to organize the search results. Regarding negative points, we can see there is a poor control of both authorship and subject matters, although these two elements are essential in information retri retrieval, as we know. Uh, most platforms do not have a multilingual indexing according to available records and documents. In many cases, there is a lack of connection with bibliographic references management uh, platforms. Regarding uh, some discrepancies uh, between the, the two uh, platforms, while OPAC scored poorly on adapting the platform to the use of mobile uh, devices, the opposite is true for the repositories. Alert subscription system for new recorders, uh, re record, records sorry, appear in 100% of the repositories, while in the OPEC appearing in 1942. Uh, search capabilities uh, to external search engines is evident in more than a half of the OPACs, while none exists in the repositories. Uh, there are no errors in accessing platform in all the repositories, uh, while it exists in 22 of the 42 OPACs. The existence of instructions in the use of the access to content is very positive in the repositories, while uh, the OPEC scores 10, 23 of, out of 42. A query history of uh, uh, surveys performed during the session is not possible in any of the repositories, while it exists in 25 of the 42 of the OPEC. Regarding the second question, uh, we, can, we can see there is a need for a greater quality control in the available content. There is a poor, a poor control on both uh, authorship and subject matters, and there is a need to have uh, information multilingual support. There is uh, a need for interactive resource between uh, platforms facilitating the user's work. 
when uh, building and developing a digital platform, we see that it's necessary to consider the diverse needs uh, and expectation of users, use a mechanism that allows rapid uh, or immediate learning uh, of the inherent dynamic, dynamics, including uh, tutorials, uh, easy and uh, direct uh, to use. Assistance uh, through the information contained in all sections, and although platforms uh, already have a significant quality, we consider that they must be optimized to achieve the goal of servicing the public in an easiest way. The research uh, also made possible to highlight the constructs in relation to each of the types of the higher education libraries, like the fact that public universities obtained better uh, results. Uh, but there is a need to understand the environment in which the platforms are produced as well uh, as the most obvious specificities and needs, economic factors, the qualification of human resources, decision-making, policies, opportunities, organizational sizes, etc. It is necessary, we, we see, to uh, ensure the factors to enable the development of these OPAC and IR platforms to achieve a quality uh, service to the users community with effective results, image and credibility of the institution, and um, that is the, the work that we, we've done uh, with uh, this paper. Thank you very much for all your attention. Thank you very much, Jose. That was uh a lot of information in a short period of time, and I'm certain I that there are going to be some questions about mm -hmm. the study, very impressive study. So uh, please, everyone, hold your questions for the end of the session. Um, we'll try to get as many in as we can. Thank you again, Jose. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm also delighted to uh, introduce the speakers for our, our last uh, session, which will be on the topic, Look What We've Got For You, Promoting Library Collections. The two speakers, the first one is Viola Voss. Dr. Voss is a senior specialist and liaison librarian for modern humanities and head of services for the libraries of the Faculty of Philologies at the Library of Münster University in Germany. Her work focuses on collection management, knowledge management, and open access and open science. She was trained as a linguist and academic librarian in Münster, where she received her master's and PhD degrees, and in Cologne, where she received her master's in library science. Our second presenter with uh, Dr. Voss is Dr. Goran Hamrin. Uh, Dr. Hamrin is the KTH Library Director of Studies and a lecturer in library and information science at the KTH Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. He's a mathematician, logician, philosopher, librarian, and information scientist. His research interests include theoretic information retrieval, library pedagogics, and research and policy analysis. His work also involves developing new research support services for KTH. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Voss and Dr. Hamrin. Good afternoon, everybody from Münster in Germany and Uppsala in Sweden. We welcome you to our talk on promoting library collections. Librarians all over the world go through lists of new books, course reading lists, book reviews and other sources, spending not only a lot of money, but also a lot of time choosing media for their collections. But once decisions have been made, that's about it in many cases. Often librarians do not do much to promote new acquisitions, but they are sad when finding out that many of the media they bought are not often used, classified as dead on arrival in the worst case. Why bother, one could ask, claiming that students and faculty will come across the resources they need, and if not, they do not need them. But as users don't have the time or the possibilities to monitor new publications the way librarians do, making it easier for users to keep up with new literature and to make interesting unexpected discoveries can be a helpful service. We all know the classics of collection marketing new acquisition shelves and lists on the library's website for freshly arrived media, or reading lists and exhibitions of books on a certain topic for existing collections. But what if the shelves can only be seen by a small number of library users coming into the building? How do you put ebooks on a real life shelf? What if it turns out that faculty have never heard of the online lists? And perhaps nowadays there is more than these classic activities. 
We wanted to know and set off on a little virtual expedition. How do libraries promote their collections? That is, if they do. We followed two paths for finding examples for collection marketing. We analyzed the websites of the Yatul member libraries and we scouted literature and random findings. The result is a little pool of ideas that can be used for inspiration. We did not assess the activities according to their effectiveness, though, as this is difficult to judge from the outside and may differ for each library. This talk has its origin in one of its speakers, that is my reflections on how to let students, graduates and faculty of my subjects know about new media in our library. The second part of our talk will therefore present some of the activities that have since been started. We went through 243 Yatul member websites and their social media activities looking for any information regarding new acquisitions or featured collections. Third insights could not be assessed because they did not work or were only available in languages we do not have sufficient knowledge of. Of the 230 sites that could be assessed, about two thirds offer some information about new additions or other items of the collections, while one third do not give this kind of information. Of the 159 libraries that do, 45 invite the users on the start page or the catalog homepage to take a look at their new acquisitions. The other libraries mention information about new or noteworthy media in places like subpages about the collections or in libguides. New acquisitions lists can be found in 65 libraries. About half of these are generated automatically, for example, via a search in the library's catalog. Some are presented in PDF files, which sometimes are outdated by several months. 11 libraries mention new or recommended media in the news blogs. Nine new social media like Facebook and Twitter. Most of these posts are relatively sporadic. For reasons of time, we'll leave it at this overview. Let's move on to some examples of different activities. We'll have to limit ourselves here as well. More examples can be found in the paper we plan to publish later in the year. Let's start with new acquisitions lists. We assume that today nobody wants to or has the time to put together these lists by hand. And while manual solutions are still out there, there is a more up-to-date solution. Lists generated weekly or monthly or as living lists via queries in the catalog or discovery system filtered down to the newest editions. An example for this can be found at the CERN library. As physicists are usually not that interested in books about French grammar and Roman studies scholars won't usually be looking for publications about quantum physics, it might be a good idea to offer subject specific lists as does the Tswane University of Technology Library. At the Library of the Free University of Bolzano, you can filter the list of new books or ebooks for the faculty library they are located in, the language, or the publication year. Ideally, these lists can be subscribed to via RSS or by an email alerting service, like at the libraries of Massey or Sabinci University. At the other end of the line, it is also a good idea to inform users about resources that have to leave, like journal or database consolations. An example for this can be found at the Arrivals and Departures page of the library in Adelaide. Now, let's have a look at where to put information about new media on a library's website. While it is quite inviting to direct users from the homepage to this information, space is limited and many services are competing for a spot here. Some libraries have found a good solution, nevertheless, like the Otago library with its small new items link under the search box. Cover images, perhaps presented in a carousel, may be a good way to promote the service while also livening up the homepage, like at the Library of the Islamic University of Technology in Gazipur. 
book covers showcased in carousels or virtual bookshelves can also give a nice look and feel on new books pages, as can be seen at Curtin University, where you can even choose between different visualizations. Another good place to inform users about new media may be the catalog homepage. As many users bookmark the catalog for quick reference, they might visit it more often than the library homepage. An example can be found at the University of Porto Library, which has different lists for new entries today, last 15 days and last month. Other logical spots for linking to this kind of information are the collections and the tips for your literature search pages. Macquarie University Library has a new titles section at the top of their collections page. Under the current awareness, uh, information about new media fits in well on sites for on, on sites about services for researchers, like in the LibGuide Staying Current, Keeping Up to Date of the Melbourne Library. Talking of LibGuides. They are useful to inform students or researchers on a subject specific level. The subject librarians can recommend media and integrate lists of new acquisitions for the subject in question or promote new databases or databases currently on trial. The library in Turku does this in the LibGuide for Education. An alternative are special LibGuides for new resources and database trials, like uh, the New Books List Guide by the University of Western Cape Library. LibGuides are often easier to edit than normal websites, but there might be a danger of getting lost in a multitude of guides, though. If a library runs dozens of guides, it should make sure there are ways of sorting or filtering the guides lists. There are more opportunities to place links to new acquisitions and similar information on a library website. Some of these places are well hidden, making it rather unlikely that users will find them. It may even be that we classify the library as giving no information because we could not find any part of the site mentioning it. It also feels a bit weird that information about interlibrary loans is much more prominent on many websites than information about local collections. Social media is a good way of communicating all sorts of information to different types of library users. <clears throat> Content can easily be published and it may come closer to the audience than via the website. Some libraries have established long running series for marketing collections, like Maud's e-resource of the week by McMaster University Library, Maud being the library's mascot eagle. With smartphones at hand, the library team can easily give new insights, like leafing through a new book, as the Belarusian National Technical University Library does in little videos accompanying their new books tweets. To finish our sample collection, we would like to show you three activities at non yatu libraries. The Library of Göttingen University offers subject-specific new acquisitions lists. In many subjects, you can even choose subtopics that should or should not be included in the list. The website of Berkeley Library features a promotion for summer reading recommendations in a news box that directs the reader to the corresponding category in the library blog. In June 2021, the Library of the University of Applied Sciences in Hannover started a Journal of the Month series on its blog. So much for some examples we encountered on our excursion. Now, let's have a look at Viola's library. When the first idea for this talk came up in 2018, Münster University Library was providing information about new acquisitions or special collections through four channels. Acquisition lists on the website, acquisition shelves in some faculty libraries, announcements of new databases in the central news, and temporary references to acquisitions on the LibGuides-like pages for my subjects from linguistics and literature studies. So this was a typical Web 1.0 situation, 
probably representative for many other libraries. Information could be delivered, but these channels had and have several downsides. Users can subscribe to new lists only by subscribing to the library newsletter or to the general news RSS feed, not by a single feed dedicated to acquisitions, let alone a feed for only one subject. There is also no email alert for these lists, which might be of interest as not many students and faculty use RSS. Physical shelves are interesting for regular visitors of these libraries, but are less useful for most other users. The library's online editorial team are the only ones filling the central news channel, not the subject librarians, and the channel does not offer a comment function. And finally, the references to new media on the libguides had to be taken down after a while to prevent them from getting overloaded. There was no way for users to subscribe to these pages and the publication of the next month posts had to be done just in time as the web content management system does not allow scheduling, scheduling of page edits. Being more and more dissatisfied with the situation, I thought about whether Web 2.0 tools might help. An example could be found close by. Our medical library has been using a weblog for several years, making it easier for more staff members to post news. Other libraries have also started using blogs for general or special news, and more and more libraries are using social media as an additional information channel. So in 2019, we launched a weblog for the subject and liaison services of our library. Based on WordPress, it lets subject librarians publish news regarding their subjects without having to ask the online editorial team. The posts can be scheduled and prepared in advance. They are categorized and tagged according to the subjects and the information is relevant for and according to formal criteria like new acquisitions from our collections, link tips, etc. Via RSS, readers can subscribe to the entire blog or to single categories or tags. They can register for an email alert and they can leave comments. RSS is also used to deliver blog posts to other websites. In my libguides, there is a news page for each subject with posts from the blog and from other sources. The feeds are set up once, then the page is kept up to date automatically. Via RSS, another channel can be filled. The subject services Twitter account set up in 2020 can automatically tweet the link to new posts using the service if this then that. The Twitter account can also be used to give link tips for teaching and research or to point out events at Münster University. Writing blog posts for my subjects takes about 45 to 60 minutes per month per subject, so about seven hours per month. For each subject, there is one post per week. Tweets are written or retweeted on the fly if an occasion occurs, for example, when I go through my Twitter timeline. The time required to care for these two channels is therefore within manageable limits. As blog posts can be scheduled, their writing can be fitted freely into the to-do list. This setup allows for an important prerequisite I had in mind. Write a blog post once, use it in several different settings without any further expense. In the first week of every month, there are posts promoting two new acquisitions per subject. Colleagues in Pennsylvania found positive correlations between the promotion of books in their libguides and the borrowing or downloads of these titles. Curious to see whether a similar correlation can be found in Münster, we took a look at the numbers for the books promoted in the blog. The usage data available for the ebooks had no sufficient coverage, so we limited our analysis to the printed books. We compared the number of lo loans with the statistics of A, all other books in the Munster collection published between 2018 and 2021, and B, the subject of all books allocated to Viola's seven subjects published in the same period. Between the books mentioned in the blog and all other books, there is no significant difference in the loans statistics.
but between the books mentioned in the blog and the other books for the same subjects there is, the featured books may have been borrowed more often than the books not featured. In addition to other possibly relevant factors like books mentioned on course reading lists or people who happen to be working on the same topics, we attribute a part of this result to the blog posts. The current setup works well and will be continued for the time being. In March 2021, a new blog category was added. Faculty recommend books or articles they consider fundamental for their teaching or research, inspiring for their career path or otherwise relevant. It might be interesting to see whether there will be a correlation with the usage of these titles as well. We will introduce a new library management and discovery system in mid-2022. It remains to be seen what possibilities this may, this may open up, for example, for new acquisitions list sorted by subject and more easily to subscribe to. Besides that, I will, for example, think about ways to inform about interesting new books published open access or about titles in big ebook packages or from evidence-based acquisition projects. As one of several new roles for academic librarians, Ronald Jans defines the marketing librarian as somebody who matches client needs with the services and resources of the library. Jans thinks that the marketing librarian constitutes a new role whose duties differ from the marketing and outreach conducted conducted by the library liaison, as she or he aims at legislators, provosts and administrators as the main stakeholders. But we think that the same role should be taken on with students and faculty as stakeholders. Every subject or liaison librarian can be a subject marketing librarian. For a project, Karen Munro adopted the rule of seven marketing model. It assumes that it takes seven touches for a potential customer to accept a call to action. As Munro and her team cannot personally reach out to every library user seven times, they decided to use at least seven methods of promoting a survey, with expectation that some users would encounter the promotion multiple times. As with many marketing activities, they could not directly attribute the high number of responses to their survey to this method, but their anecdotal experience is that these efforts were at least partly to thank for. So when you think about marketing, try to find more than one way of reaching out to your different stakeholders, following a multi-pronged uh, strategy like Monroe. The examples from our survey can hopefully give you some inspiration for this. It might be interesting to enlarge this collection with examples from other academic and also public libraries, which are often more active in all things marketing to broaden the scope. Moreover, we should also include the viewpoint of library users. A study asking whether they may have informational needs regarding collections that are not yet met by libraries would be an interesting complement. Meanwhile, we encourage you to think about marketing your collections. They surely deserve it. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. Thank you, Garen. That was uh, the, a, very, a very impressive presentation. All three presentations uh, represent uh, fascinating research projects and the conclusions are, are very um, uh, inspiring. So I'm going to at this point invite our uh, audience to place questions in the Q&A chat button uh, and uh, we'll see if uh, we can have a dialogue. Oh, to Tatiana, there is the first question. Uh, I don't know if you can see it, Tatiana. Is the postgraduate yes. curriculum you can see it? Yes, it's, 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 if it is sufficient, sufficiently comprehensive for the various areas of knowledge. Yes, thank you, Louisa, for the, your question. I think so, because open science is a transversal movement 
and the information literacy is also a, a frame that is sufficient, uh, flexible, and adaptable to various circumstances. So with the right uh, adaptation, I think it's, uh, yes, it, it will fulfill that, that quest. Thank you. The second question is for Jose. I don't know if you can see it, Jose. Uh, yes, yes, I, I can see it. Good. Yes, thank you. Um, the evaluation uh, indicators used are based on, um, yes, they are based, but they are uh, also uh, adapted uh, to these uh, specific conditions of the OPEC uh, and the repositories uh, here uh, in uh, Portugal. Um, it, it, these indicators were, were adapted uh, throughout uh, our research and uh, that was the way that we achieved uh, the, the metrics that we uh, used uh, in this investigation. Thank you, Jose. We're open for more questions. While we're waiting, I can ask one question. Jose, did you, um, your study, did it map the, the names or the, the names of the different platforms for OPACs and institutional repositories uh, in any way to the, uh, the study? Um, yes, uh, there, there are uh, appendixes that have that, uh, that information for each one of the platforms uh, concerning each one of the institutions. Okay. I'm sure there's another question lurking out there. Someone must have. Um, I guess I will ask a question for Garen and for Viola. In your publication, will you have recommended best practices in these areas? I assume you will. It seems like you've developed some concepts there. Well, we will present some examples, but I would not necessarily classify them as best practice because best practice always depends on the library in question and their stakeholders and their users. So we will do a collection of um, examples that um, we found interesting, mentionable, um, that we could imagine for our libraries. Perhaps even some examples where we think, mm, perhaps this could, should not be copied. Um, but um, perhaps we, we could better name this good practice and not best practice because every library has to find out what a good solution for, for the library in question uh, would be. And I would agree. Uh, I don't believe in best practices. I believe in better practices because the word best rules out the concept of learning. Hence, go for better practices. Very interesting observation, Garen. Thank you for that. And, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing this. It's, it's quite an impressive study. We'll make a last call for questions. Perhaps I, if there's no question, I can um, um, do a, um, ask the audience if you encounter some interesting examples, if you think that your library has a good a way of promoting new or interesting older collections, just give us a shout, uh, send us an email. We are always interested, be it YATL or non yatl libraries. Um, they just add to our collections and perhaps we find some, some more things that we have over, overlooked so far. Thank you. Thank you, Viola. Very good use of, of the opportunity. And I want to also thank each of our presenters, not only for uh, creating such interesting studies and, uh, and, and for presenting them here, but uh, doing it so effectively and efficiently, each of you stayed within the time limit. Very impressive work across the board. 
Uh, and thanks to the audience again for joining us for today's session. And we'll look forward to seeing you in the lobby and at the next session. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. See you Bye -bye. next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <clears throat>